Good evening. This is David Unsworth, host of the Pan Am Post English Podcast. As the host of a libertarian-themed podcast, I often try to find rationale in the course of American history for my thinking. For example, George Washington's farewell address warns us of the dangers of foreign entanglements and unwise military commitments overseas. A reminder that the post-9-11 world sorely needs. I would describe myself as a constitutionalist first, a libertarian second, and a pragmatist third. Taking into consideration all American political voices, I think that Ron Paul has been consistently the best mind on foreign policy in a generation. He has opposed our foreign military adventurism in the Middle East, which has fueled destabilization in the entire region, evidenced by the spread of brutal civil wars in Syria and Iraq. He has demonstrated how the so-called war on terror has been used as a pretext to justify massive increases in the size and scope of government. He has been one of the few voices questioning our decision to fund and arm Saudi Arabia as they fight a war in Yemen that has wreaked massive humanitarian chaos. But the doctrine of non-interventionism can also be taken too far as well. Paul wrote a piece this week for the Ron Paul Institute entitled, Is North Korea Really a State Sponsor of Terrorism? in which he suggests the Trump administration's hard line on North Korea will ultimately be counterproductive. He writes, Has Pyongyang been found guilty of some spectacular terrorist attack overseas or perhaps of plotting to overthrow another country by force? No, that is not the case. North Korea is back on the U.S. list of state sponsors of terrorism because President Trump thinks the move will convince the government to give up its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile program. He believes that continuing down the path toward confrontation with North Korea will lead the country to capitulate to Washington's demands. That will not happen. Paul then proceeds to compare North Korea's assassination of Kim Jong-un's half-brother with our assassination of American Yemeni cleric Anwar al-Awlaki. Al-Awlaki is described as the imam who had the greatest success in America and then later in Britain in inspiring violent acts of terrorism, and he's credited with inspiring the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, the 2015 San Bernardino attack, and the Orlando nightclub massacre in 2016. Paul then suggests that this is a machination by the neocons to push a war with North Korea, specifically citing uh, former ambassador to the UN, John Bolton. Generally, I would agree with Paul, but I'm not quite sure that this is what they are doing in this case. Uh, I've been following Ron Paul's career for uh, 25 years, really, and I'd say generally, uh, on most things, particularly on foreign policy, I probably agree with him 90% of the time, but there is this tendency to take this anti-war sentiment, the principle of non-interventionism, a little too far. Let me read here another quote from, from Paul's article in the Ron Paul Institute. Designating North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism will allow President Trump to impose the highest level of sanctions on North Korea. Does anyone believe more sanctions, which hurt the suffering citizens of North Korea the most, will actually lead North Korea's leadership to surrender to Washington's demands? Sanctions never work. They hurt the weakest and most vulnerable members of society the hardest and affect the elites the least. When is force justified in American foreign policy or in any foreign policy? Ron Paul appears here to object to any use of force against North Korea and to anything that leads us toward, towards a confrontation. Uh, I am not quite sure how I feel about that. Uh, for example, I, one of the things I liked the most about Trump on the campaign trail was that he said he wasn't going to put boots on the ground overseas, and he specifically cited he did not want a military buildup with Russia. He did not want uh, Europe and Russia. He did not want a, a return to kind of a Cold War scenario. He said that would be counterproductive. That's what I really liked about Trump. I thought, wow, Trump is sounding like Ron Paul here, as opposed to Hillary Clinton, who... <laughs> appeared to want some massive uh, military buildup and confrontation with Russia. Well, Russia and North Korea are not equivalents here, and the United States and North Korea and Trump and Kim are not moral equivalents. 
The United States is about the freest country in the world, while North Korea is about the most oppressive country in the world. Regardless of what Trump's critics say, he has checks and balances at every turn. For those who think that Trump is some sort of dictator, consider the fact that he can't even get a Republican-controlled Congress to go along with him on 90% of his policy proposals. I mean, it. this is the, the, the classic libertarian. I mean, the, you have a, a huge spectrum here. You have everything from Republicans who lean libertarian, moderate libertarians, to uh, anarcho-capitalists, to anarchists, to to a place where kind of the far left and the far right meet, uh, someone, even someone on the far left like Noam Chomsky, who, who actually probably would agree with Ron Paul on a lot of foreign policy issues. But as a constitutionalist, a libertarian, and a pragmatist, we have to consider that there are times when we need to use force. Uh, there is simply no way around it, and I think Ron Paul is being a bit naive here. I mean, for example, uh, I completely believe in diplomacy, and I completely believe in negotiations, and I completely believe that war should be avoided. I wouldn't say at all costs, but war, we really should try to avoid military conflict whenever we can. But I'm going to use here an example that anyone who's taken a high school history course has studied in detail Adolf Hitler, Neville Chamberlain, uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, we can't just give in to dictators. We can't. I mean, Hitler claimed in numerous speeches that Czechoslovakia would be his last territorial demand. He said it many times. That's it. I just want Czechoslovakia. And Neville Chamberlain went to negotiate with him, said, well, we give Hitler Czechoslovakia, we will have achieved peace in our time. And boom, we, we just wrote off 10 million people, 10 million innocent Czechs and Slovaks who don't get to have a say in it, and we just rolled over and played dead and gave Hitler what he wanted. I am all in favor of the anti-war movement within the libertarian movement, but I am not a pacifist. I'm completely against pacifism. And as soon as you analyze it on any level, pacifism is a complete and utter failure. When you are talking about the rise of fascist and socialist and communist governments over the 20th century, uh, from Nazi Germany to the Soviet Union, from Mao's China to Pol Pot's Cambodia, from uh, Franco's Spain to Italy's Mussolini, from Eastern Europe to Southeast Asia, uh, Pacifism is a complete and utter farce. I mean, so the Nazis are at your door waiting to herd you into ghettos, waiting to ship you off in boxcars to concentration camps. You're telling me you're going to be a pacifist? You're just going to roll over and play dead and not fight back? Nelson Mandela and that ANC, the African National Congress, they were not pacifists. In, in today's politically correct environment, that lie may be spread. Nelson Mandela and the ANC were not pacifists. They were engaged in a violent campaign of industrial sabotage and terrorist acts against the South African government. Now, many would say they were justified. That's, that's not really the issue on the table here. Uh, the leaders of the American Revolution, the Founding Fathers, were not pacifists. Uh, so let's not be naive here. I mean, I love Ron Paul, and I agree with him on many things, but non-interventionism has to be balanced with common sense. There are nations and organizations in the world that seek to do incredible harm to the United States, its citizens, and its interests. And there are situations in which only the legitimate use of force is the appropriate solution. And I don't buy into this narrative that uh, Trump is being so reckless here, and really this is... Trump's fault, or, or Trump and Kim are some kind of moral equivalence, and Trump is going to start a nuclear war with his Twitter account. That is complete and utter hogwash. Uh, Trump is not to blame here. What Trump is saying is that if the North Korean regime was ever crazy enough to attack the United States, we will level them to the ground in a matter of minutes. And that's how it should be. That is absolutely how it should be.
I mean, this is not, uh, th this is war. This is war, and desperate times call for desperate measures. Paul goes on here to cite, uh, he says basically, well, if Trump is going to say that Kim Jong-un assassinated someone in the airport in Kuala Lumpur, it happened to be his half-brother of all things, well, who are we to say that North Korea can't do that because we assassinated Yemeni cleric uh, Anwar al-Awlaki? Uh, it, it is a reasonable enough point as an American citizen you are supposed to be entitled to a trial. But, I would rather have a drone program than boots on the ground overseas. That is the bottom line. If you, if you pulled the American public, how would you rather fight terrorism? Would you rather take out dangerous terrorists with drones, or would you rather risk American lives and have military forces in a dozen countries around the world who respond and have to capture people as opposed to kill them and then take them to court trials. I mean, this is a slam dunk issue here. The, yeah, there there are, I understand libertarians have serious concerns about the drone program. There are people on the far left that have serious concerns about the drone program. Uh, I would rather eliminate dangerous terrorists than allow them to build up followers who are certain to plan bigger and bolder attacks on American citizens and threaten our interests around the world. Al Alaki's right to a trial must be balanced against the protection of life and liberty for American citizens and really all people worldwide. I mean, if Paul is going to criticize us at this point, we can make the same case for Osama bin Laden. Was he was it ever proved in a court of law that he was guilty for masterminding 9/11? I mean, should should we should the rules of engagement for that operation in Pakistan have been, well, you can't shoot first and you have to capture him alive. We wouldn't want to deprive him of his constitutional rights, you know, and, and also it would, be, it would be very unfair and unjust to take out Osama bin Laden, bin Laden in a drone strike. I mean, come on. This is war. This is war. War calls for desperate measures. And uh, if there's some overlap with the Republican Party, with the right wing, I am in. I completely can, in good conscience, as a very devout libertarian, say that I have no problem with our use of a drone program. Absolutely no problem with it. The other thing here, when we're talking about a drone program, is the financial aspect. We can cut military spending significantly and still fight terrorism. That's one thing I love Ron Paul on. Ron Paul is one of the few people in the Republican Party who is saying look, our military spending is just crazy. It's out of control. Uh, we need to relentlessly hammer terrorist groups, not pay for an expensive military presence around the entire globe that benefits our allies more than it benefits American citizens. Why, for example, are we paying for the defense of wealthy nations in Europe and East Asia? I mean, that's just nuts. There, there is no question about this. Why our military and the outrageous amount of money we spend in our military. In fiscal year 2015, it was $600 billion. Why aren't Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and uh, the UK and France and Germany and Spain and so forth, all the countries that benefit from our military spending, why are we paying to defend them? I mean, that's just nuts. I understand that they're allies and we should have our back in a geopolitical sense if it ever were to come to that. But it is insane, and I think both on the right and on the left we can agree with this, it is insane that the American taxpayers are footing at least part of the bill for protecting our allies around the world. And that amount of money I cited, uh, specifically $596 billion in, in to, fiscal year 2015, we spend more on our military than the next eight nations combined. Uh, that is utter insanity. So this is one thing where I have to agree with the Democrats. When Democrats say we need to cut military spending, they're absolutely right. Now the problem is they want to cut military spending so that the government can do more. I want to cut military spending because we don't need to spend $600 billion a year on our military. We could spend far less money, pay down our national debt, 
approve some tax cuts, and have a better foreign policy. We, 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 we spend more than China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, the United Kingdom, India, France, Japan, and Germany combined on our military. So, uh, look it up. Look it up. That is a fact. And when it comes to the principle of non-interventionism, the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, so what do we do about extremely serious humanitarian crises around the world? Bosnia, Somalia, uh, Haiti, Congo. Uh, again, I, I realize that many libertarians and conservatives have serious qualms about the UN. And some people even suggest we should pull out of the UN. I say no. One of the best things that the UN does, and I don't agree with the UN on many, many things, but the idea of the United Nations International Peacekeeping Forces, I think, is fundamentally a good idea. And again, on this one, I think I have to agree with the Democrats. We, we should try to go it alone less and work more with the international community, specifically on things like UN International Peacekeeping Forces. Uh, the UN is not perfect, but... I don't think it's a good idea for the United States to go in unilaterally and try to fix situations. It's just not going to work. And say what you will about what these peacekeeping missions have done in the past. Uh, there were serious problems, for example, in Bosnia. But the conflict did end. Did, did, did the UN do a good job there? Well, that's debatable. They, they, they had limited rules of engagement. They had an extremely volatile situation on their hands in which they by the rules under which they were there, they could not really take sides in the, in the situation. So, so fundamentally here, just, just wrapping up, uh, I, and even Ron Paul, I don't think Ron Paul is not a pacifist, and he's not completely a isolationist or non-interventionist, but I, I don't think Ron Paul can be naive here. It, we do need to use force against North Korea. I certainly hope it doesn't come to a military engagement. But for Ron Paul to just suggest that you know we can't tell North Korea what to do because we used a drone on uh, extremely dangerous dangerous terrorist who has uh, blood of hundreds of American citizens on his hand, uh, I'm sorry, Ron. I I don't quite agree with you there. The bottom line is. Yes, non-interventionism is a good principle, but it is, a, it is a principle. There are always exceptions to the rule, and I think we need to remember that as constitutionalists, as libertarians, and as pragmatists. This has been David Unsworth with the Pan Am Post podcast. Thank you very much for listening, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel.